2017 is over, and what a great year it was. But as great as the year as 2017 was, it was an even better year for video games. I thought 2016 was great, but 2017 brought some of the best games I had played in a very, very long time. And much like last year, I compiled my top 10 games of the year. Now, as a reminder, this is merely my opinion. There are going to be games on there that you may disagree with, or games uh, that are not on there that you wish were. But that's the glory of these kinds of videos. Everybody has their own differing opinion, and you may like a lot of the same things I like, or you might hear about a game that you haven't played yet and you can check out. So, here are my top 10 games of 2017. Supergiant Games is almost always a safe bet. Bastion took the world by storm with their adorable art style and absolutely killer soundtrack and narrator. Transistor looked to mix it up a bit, but kept the same Supergiant style of gameplay we were all used to from Bastion, and while the combat was a tiny bit divisive, the game is still held rightfully in high regard. Then along came Pyre. People expected yet another Supergiant game, but this time around they changed things up, and it was for lack of a better word, incredible. One part choose your own adventure, one part magical basketball, Pyre was looking to do something very different from previous Supergiant games. Replacing combat with a sports game in a fantasy world filled with imaginative characters, compelling story, writing, and voice acting, absolutely gorgeous art and plot twists and turns, all while the mystery of the world, magic, and kingdom slowly unravels while you play, hooked me right from the start. I enjoyed the magical basketball game as much as I enjoyed the choose-your-own-adventure style visual novel that accompanied it. Pyre is heartwarming, heart-wrenching, funny, and purely enjoyable, and continues to prove why Supergiant are a master at their craft. I don't really know how to properly tell you why I loved Little Nightmares. It's a physics-based 2.5D platformer in the same vein as Play Dead's Limbo or Inside. And when I started to play Little Nightmares, that's all my expectations really were for the game. A weird semi-horror platformer with some pretty art design. But as you continue to delve into the world of Little Nightmares and really listen at what it's trying to tell you with its themes and moods, it started pushing itself past those baseline expectations and really taking on a life of its own. The puzzles themselves were enjoyable, challenging, and each one was filled with tense moments that had my heart racing and me at the edge of my seat. But underneath the gameplay lay an interesting, more creative story that spoke to real-world horrors in a very fantastical way. And for that reason alone, I highly recommend it. So this one comes with a caveat. I'm only about halfway through this massive JRPG. So no, I haven't beaten Persona 5 yet. However, before y'all get all angry, boo, Mathis, finish every game you play, ooh, boo, I it on your lips, but boo. The fact that I'm even plugging away at a JRPG in the first place is indicative to how good this game is. Now, back in my day, <laughs> I sound like a grandpa, and back in my day, uh, when I was but a wee lad, I was huge into JRPGs. Uh, ravenous for them even. I played so many damn JRPGs on the PlayStation 1, I could probably name almost all the ones that exist. But as time went on and Western RPGs became more popular, I eventually made the switch over to Western RPGs because I just kind of prefer that style. More control over the story, more choices uh, that's taking place within the game. And Western RPGs are really great for that. But Persona 5 reminded me why I was so in love with JRPGs when I was younger. I'm sure I'm preaching to the choir, but Persona 5 is incredibly stylish, polished, mature, but still lighthearted, and holy fuck, it's a beautiful game. From the music to the character designs to the turn-based battles and Pokemon-esque capture system, right down to the friggin' menus, Persona 5 oozes style, love, passion, and gosh dang it, the game is just plain fun. 
Now I warn you, you'll need to put on your weeb pants for this one, but even the most anti-weeb out there, I think, would find something to like about Persona 5. Calling it just a JRPG feels disingenuous. It's a management game, a visual novel, a JRPG, a collectathon, a roller coaster of emotions, and I love it. I played the reboot of Wolfenstein, Wolfenstein The New Order, about a year or so after it had launched. I didn't think I'd enjoy it as I wasn't really into the old style or old school FPS games anymore, and Wolfenstein seemed to be selling itself on the premise that it was old school but with a new coat of paint. But eventually, I played it for a stream and I really fell in love with that game. The high action in conjunction with surprisingly real emotional depth and characters with their own tragedies and troubles displayed right at your doorstep, all while dealing with Nazis who have robots and cyborgs and weird alien technology is a combination that on paper shouldn't work. But it did, and it worked out really well and Wolfenstein The New Colossus continued that trend. It doesn't change up much from the formula of the first installment, but the new setting and continued tragic story of BJ Blazkowicz and friends kept engaging me from start to finish. The new characters merge seamlessly into the fold, and some decisions you actually made in the first game carry right over into this new installment. And the first time you lay eyes on the American streets completely covered in Nazi paraphernalia, knowing that in this world the Nazis beat the United States, is one that kicks you in the gut and makes you think. It seems this will be the second installment in a planned trilogy as well, so here's to hoping Machine Games continues kicking Nazi ass. Uh, yeah, I, I don't, I don't really know how to explain Near Automata. Uh, it, I mean, it's it's a really good platinum games action adventure, but it's also about a robot girl and her robot husbando or robot boyfriend coming to Earth because the Earth is taken over by other robot waifus and husbandos, and there's like musical robots, and then there's the peaceful robots in the forest, and the humans live in a space station on the moon, and then when you are doing the missions on Earth, there you do come across some other humans. Uh, you then have to play, after you beat the game the first time, a second time as the ro robot b b husbando in the same story, but it's different, and all the upgrades that you have can t carry over, over, and then you get a different ending, but then you gotta play the game a third time to really get the real ending, and the music is really good, and the action is, is superb, and the, the game is actually pretty, pretty damn good looking overall, and there's some interesting themes on, on humanity and morality, and to play it at least three times to, to really get the full, the full encompassing story is weird, and it's, it's, it's really weird, you know, like, you know, Near Automata is really a, a, a weird game, and the gameplay mechanics are amazing, but the story is equally interesting. And there is at one point like a naked robot man that shows up early on as a boss fight, and he just is that kind of came out of nowhere. And then you got the song "We Will Not Continue." We will not. That's really good. That's really good. Just play Near Automata. You like just just play it. You owe it to yourself to play this game. It's it's just good. It, it's good. I've said it before and I'll just say it again. Prey should actually just be called System Shock 3. Without a doubt, Prey is pretty much the spiritual successor to System Shock. It is much, much closer to what I imagine a new System Shock in this era would be than the reboot of the Prey series that Prey actually is. In fact, it is related to Prey in pretty much name only. Everything else about it is new and extremely good. The gameplay mechanics are an FPS RPG hybrid, allowing you to level up skills that'll open up a plethora of different ways to tackle any objective that you come across on the space station that you're currently trapped on. Maybe you could hack a door that would lead to the objective through a back route, or use brute strength to lift a huge object blocking the stairwell that leads you there. Or just take out all your guns and shoot every alien in your path. 
Oh, and don't forget to keep an eye out for mimics as well. Those aliens can take the shape of any inanimate object in the room. Scanning each room for something that seems out of place will be imperative to not being caught off guard and surprise attacked and also jump scared. Or better yet, adapt and inject yourself with some alien goo and do as the aliens do. Then how, how do I, I just don't understand how I write rhymes and don't realize I write rhymes until I actually speak the, the, the line. There's so many options here in both gameplay and story with multiple endings and so many ways to tackle the game in this open world. It's purely sandbox fun. And it continues to twist and turn right until the very end. System Shock 3, I mean, Prey is well worth checking out. It's been a damn long time since Resident Evil was even remotely enjoyable for me. Hell, the last one I played had Chris Redfield literally punching a boulder during a boss fight against Wesker in a volcano. And it was a lot less badass than it sounds on paper. The horror aspect of Resident Evil had all but been removed and it had become a cheesy B-action movie in video game form. But to my surprise, Capcom heard the wailing of Resident Evil fans everywhere and did a 180 on us. No more silly action movie games and in its place a first person horror game where you're trapped in the cannibalistic home of the Baker family. It's a very simple story on the surface. Your wife goes missing and all roads seem to point to this backwoods area where the Bakers live. After some short exploration, you're taken captive and it's up to you to find your wife and escape. All the while, the seemingly unkillable Baker family stalks you through their home, hunting you, calling for you. It gets under your skin, it creeps you out, and makes you feel helpless. It is truly horrifying. But the worst part of Resident Evil 7? Ugh, grandma's always peeping on you. All right, fam, we top three now. We lit, we getting serious for real. Oh, let's talk about a game where a bug kingdom is overrun by the disease that distorts and controls its host's minds on a world on the verge of collapse and a quest to murder, at their request, mind you, the guardians keeping that particular disease at bay once and for all. Hollow Knight caught me by absolute surprise. I hadn't heard of it until a good month after its release, and it being a Metroidvania style game didn't do it any favors in my book. I have nothing particularly against that type of game, it's just not one I am immediately drawn to. But holy heck in a handbasket, am I glad I tried it anyway. Team Cherry produced an instant masterpiece and I absolutely loved it. While Hollow Knight is a Metroidvania in the most literal sense, it also takes inspirations from some surprising sources as well. Hollow Knight is the most Dark Souls, non-Dark Souls game I've played in, well, since, since Dark, Dark Souls. The combat is tight and responsive, but requires skill and focus to master. The world is filled with secrets and mysteries, shortcuts to open, and bosses to tackle. All the while, the story is told in a way that requires you to put in some effort in lore dive yourself, if you're so inclined. See, much like Dark Souls, you can miss all the lore in the world building if it doesn't interest you. But if you're into that kind of thing, there's a lot to unpack here. Visuals to see, absorb, and then really ponder. And a buttload of theories that could all make sense under the right circumstances. Hollow Knight is simply superb. Oh boy, it has been a while since a Mario game has hooked me, but Damn, did Mario Odyssey absolutely nail this outing. It's been a while since we've had a truly 3D Mario game, with Galaxy 2 being the most recent one, and it was about dang time we had another one. This time around, Mario is accompanied by a hat named Cappy that can and does possess the bodies of Mario's enemies, and don't don't think, don't think about it too much, because when you realize that most enemies die after Mario possesses them, it gets a little depressing. I'm honest. But that mechanic is so good. What can I say about Mario Odyssey that hasn't already been said? The levels are gorgeous and absolutely perfectly designed. The movement mechanics of Mario are tight, precise, and perfect. His new abilities in conjunction with Cappy allow for masterful movement throughout the worlds Mario will be visiting, making the act of moving around itself an absolute pleasure. Just jumping around, exploring, finding secrets is 10 out of 10 fun. It's a, it's a blast. Enemy possession replaces your typical power-ups that you'd find in a Mario game, each enemy giving you a couple of fun and unique abilities to play around with, allowing you to access otherwise inaccessible areas and creating some really fun, if a little easy, boss fights. The music is 
literal perfection, and New Donk City is one of the best worlds in Mario in years, and it's completely enemy free. I haven't fanboyed over a Mario game in God knows how long. And to put it simply, Mario Odyssey felt magical in a way video games haven't felt to me in, I don't know, since I was but a wee lad. I loved every second I've played with Mario, and I am going to go back for more. You should too. But as good as Mario was, however, Divinity Original Sin 2 completely floored me with how utterly fantastic the game was from top to bottom. A CRPG with a bunch of modern twists and polish, Larian Studios absolutely hit a home run with their game and rightfully deserved the number one spot on my list. There wasn't a moment in this game where I wasn't smiling, laughing, or just genuinely impressed at the developer's attention to detail within the game. If you had the tools and thought process to come up with a weird solution to a problem you were having in the game, you could pull it off. Set your rogue off the beaten path, hidden away in a bush from prying eyes of the city guard. Have your mage teleport a nearby shopkeeper from his stand right next to your rogue, but still without being seen by the police. Then have the rogue rob the shopkeeper blind before he knows what happened and sneak off with all your new loot while the shopkeeper panics and shouts that he's been robbed. Or maybe there's a maze that's been giving you a lot of issues, but you just got a new pair of gloves that allow you to teleport party members. Teleport one of your party members through that locked gate at the end of the maze, hand the gloves through the gate, and then teleport yourself over. Problem solved, in your own way. And that kind of freedom is what defines Divinity 2. Combat is equally sandbox in nature, mixing different elemental spells with the ground, setting pools of oil on fire or puddles of water electrified, work together, combine your abilities and spells, and just have a blast in this incredibly freeform CRPG. I sit back astounded by what Larian Studios was able to accomplish here, and I sincerely hope that game has all the success in the world. It is well deserved. It's been years since I've played a CRPG like this and enjoyed it as much as I have, and the wait has been well worth it. You owe it to yourself, if you're even a passing fan of RPGs, to play Divinity Original Sin 2. You will not regret it. We can only hope 2018 is a fraction as good as 2017 was for the video gaming industries. And while I'll be playing all of my glorious retro PC and console games for you guys here on this channel, I'll be playing all the new fun indie and AAA stuff over on my Let's Play channel. Again, thank you all so much for watching. If you enjoyed this style of content, don't forget to hit the like button and subscribe. And if you want to support me more directly, there's a Patreon link down below. What are your favorite games of 2017? That'll be my question of the video. A pretty simple one and fits the theme pretty well if I do say so myself. I'm eager to see what your lists consist of and maybe it'll see something that I ended up missing and I could check out on my own. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you very soon. Bye bye.